I'd like to welcome you this evening to the uh, Frontiers of Science Lectures. Uh, my name is, is Frank Brown. I'm the Dean of the College of Mines and Earth Sciences and the co-host of this uh, lecture series along with Pierre Sokolsky, uh, who's the Dean of the College of Science. Pierre has a bad leg uh, tonight, he tells me. We had lunch together. We've been a bit thin on lectures this year, but we're already working on the lineup for next year. And we do want to bring you the best, but the best are very hard to pin down, and sometimes they say yes, and then they say no, and we've had a series of those this year. Uh, I want to thank this evening's sponsor, Biofire Diagnostics Incorporated. It's a company that specializes in molecular diagnostics, began in Idaho and moved down here to Utah. It's now located in the university's research park. Their continued support of science education at the university is very much appreciated. I am asked to announce that if you haven't done so, uh, please complete a survey that you find on the tables outside and turn it into one of the staff members. These surveys help us improve our public events and also give you a chance to win some gifts at the end of tonight's event. With that, and with no further delay, I'm excited for tonight's lecture to begin, our speaker right there. And here to introduce our speaker is Neil Vickers, who is the chair of the Department of Biology here at the university. Neil. Okay, can I get this slide switched over to the laptop? Oh, it's asking for your password. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's my great pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, my colleague, Professor Velu Marik. I've divided my introduction into three brief parts. The first one is the past. Velu was born in New York and he was raised in New Jersey. He was educated at Brown University and it was as an undergraduate there that he was first exposed to real bench science in the lab of Dr. Russell Church. He then went on to do a combined MD-PhD. Uh, it was a joint program between UC San Francisco and UC Berkeley. And it was here and in a subsequent postdoctoral appointment that Velu further developed his interest in neuroscience and apprenticed in the techniques uh, associated with molecular biology. <coughs> Rather than pursuing a medical career though, he had an MD-PhD uh, by this point he, uh, w which would have had a subservient research interest, he decided to put research front and center in his career. He'd already developed an interest in neuroscience and learned the molecular tools that one could use to address important questions, but he realized that uh, one needed to work with a system that harnessed the power of modern genetics, and that led him to the lab of Corey Bargman where it was possible to direct these three approaches, that's neuroscience, molecular biology, and genetics, at questions in just one organism, the nematode C. elegans. And I'm sure that you're going to hear more about this rather unassuming animal during Dr. Marik's talk this evening. Two, the present. Velu started as an assistant professor in biology here in 1996. He is currently a professor of biology and the founding director of the, of the Center for Cell and Genome Science. It's an interdisciplinary research unit that brings together scientists from physics, chemistry, and biology. The third part is the person. So being from England myself, as you can probably tell by my accent, I have special permission by royal decree <laughs> to invent new English words. And Velu is, a, is, an unusual, is an unusual name, as I'm sure that you'll, you'll agree. And so I thought I could derive some new words from that root that might give you some insight into his personality. So the personality is obviously a part of the scientist as well. So you'll learn something about Velu as a scientist by learning about his personality. <coughs> 
Valu is recognized far and wide for his penchant for great food and fine wines. This frequently translates into expensive restaurants. <laughs> so I've coined a word for this, and that's the luxury. <laughs> Villou is well known for his outdoorsmanship. He enjoys fishing. He enjoys backpacking. And he enjoys hiking with friends, family, and colleagues. In fact, Villou is an enthusiastic spokesperson for the University of Utah and the state of Utah in his travels, and which, which are wide. He often talks favorably about this great state. He is also an ardent cyclist. In fact, he's a bit of a balance. <laughs> but Lance is a bit of a villain these days. <laughs> so perhaps there's a better word that we can come up with. Anyone who participates in the so-called death ride in Nevada, an annual event, which encompasses riding 129 miles with 15,000 feet of climbing in one single day can only be of a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes aside, I should say that Valu brings these same qualities, this intensity, focus, and drive that's required to compete in such arduous events to his science. Well, hopefully I've succeeded in drawing a picture of Velou for you, a illustration, if you will. <laughs> I'd better stop now. Things are getting a, <laughs> things are getting a bit ludicrous. <laughs> Velou's talk today is entitled Exploring the Machinery of Memory, New Insights, New Directions. So I'll hand over to our speaker this evening, and ask him to enlighten you by saying, of course, Velu, Veluminate. Well, you'll probably learn more about me from Neil's uh, introduction than uh, what I'll tell you today about the worm. So thank you very much for that kind introduction. It was voluminating. <laughs> and I also want to thank uh, Dean Sikalski and Dean, Dean Brown from the College of Science and Minds for uh, extending this invitation so I could come and talk to you. And I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight to hear about some of the exciting things that are taking place in the College of Science at the University of Utah. So tonight I'll tell you about memory. And in the process, I hope to impart to you some of the excitement that I and my colleagues have in doing research here at the University of Utah. And by colleagues, I mean some of our colleagues are going to be, are now and will be your sons and daughters. And a main driver of the research efforts at the University of Utah lie in the rich pool of really talented students that come to the University of Utah from across the state. So the importance of memory, I think, is best stated in this line from a play by Tennessee Williams. Life is all memory except for the one present moment that goes by you so quick you hardly catch it going. And if you think about it, we're really all just memory machines, aren't we? I mean, everything that we do depends on memory. In fact, all of us need memory to remember 
where things were, how to plan for the future, what's bad, what's good, what's dangerous. And without memory, we can do precious little. So let's talk about, I'll just give you a quick introduction to tonight's talk. I'm going to tell you about how memory is really revered by all societies going back to antiquity. Our early efforts to understand memory in the last century and how there's a new consensus that memory lies somehow in the connections between neurons in the brain. And I'll explain more about that in a bit. Then I'll turn to studies in my own lab focused on the machinery of memory. So if you think of our brains as complicated machines, part of that machinery has to do with how we store and process information. And we'd like to know how that machinery works. And finally, I just want to end a little bit about the wonderful opportunities that are being developed at the University of Utah for interdisciplinary education and the opportunities for, new, for students who come to the University of Utah. So our society, our culture, is obsessed with memory in many ways. And a lot of that you can see just in the literature that we have, movies we go to. One of my favorite series of movies is the Bourne series. Probably the best series ever made, except for the, the Clint Eastwood series, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And, but, but still, excellent series. But it's not just our society that reveres memory. The ancient Greeks thought memory was the most important part of civilization. And one of their most powerful goddesses was Mnemosyne, Mnemosyne. And Mnemosyne, with Zeus, had nine children. They were the nine muses. They were the personification of knowledge and arts and education. The Greeks believed that memory was important to maintain the structure of society itself. And they had specially trained servants called mnemons. And mnemons were trained to memorize. That memorization was thought to be the glue that kept everything together as a society. So from generation to generation, that society would stay intact. And the mnemons memorized law and memorized literature. The Iliad was a famous book. Many of you probably read it in high school and college. It's a poem with over 15,000 lines. And this was written in 800 BC. And those 15,000 lines were memorized by Nemans and passed from generation to generation. Now, perhaps the most famous Nemans was the Nemans associated with Achilles. Achilles was a mighty warrior featured in the Iliad. And he had a terrible temper. And his mother, the goddess Thetis, warned, Apollo, excuse me, warned Achilles that if he ever killed the son of Apollo, an even more powerful god, that he himself would die by Apollo's hand. And so she sent a servant named Nemon, from which we get mnemonic, accompanying him for the sole purpose of reminding him, don't kill one of Apollo's kids. But Achilles saw one of Apollo's kids, Tennis, hurling a huge rock from a cliff at the Greek ships, and he swam ashore in a fit of anger, thoughtlessly thrust him through the heart. Anyway, Achilles put, then realized that this was a bad thing, and Naman didn't warn him, uh, put Naman to death. So um, this shows both the importance of memory and the tragedy if you lose your memory. The Greeks were taken over by the Romans, and the Romans thought this idea of mnemonics and mnemons and servants who memorized law was fantastic. And they became part of what they called extended memory. So a politician, a lawyer back in ancient Rome, he would want to please his friends. He would want to make sure he could control his enemies. So he had servants, these Nemans, they were called Graeculi, little Greeks, as a diminutive and insulting terms. And these little Greeks had to memorize stuff. They had to memorize land holdings and laws and, and the peculiarities of their friends and foes. And so they accompanied the rich politicians and lawyers and were the constant kind of memory bank, telling them who they should flatter, who they should uh, ignore. 
And this was extremely important for the career of the politician. Of course, now we have iPhones and Blackberries and Google to do the same thing. But this was predated, this idea of having a memory. And that memory, even back then, they wanted it to be infallible, irreproachable, always good. Okay? Because everything depended on if you forgot something, you could be uh, killed. So back to our present culture, this fascination with memory and the importance of memory and to try and make it better uh, has been brought to new levels. So Thad Starner is a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology. You can see he's wearing these weird goggles, that, uh, glasses that have a little camera in them. And uh, he always carries that back kind of bag with him, kind of uh, extended man purse carrying his computer. And for 20 years, he's had that outfit. And he has videotaped and recorded every event in his life, every event, all day, so that he would have a memory. He could go back to fifth grade. Well, it started after fifth grade. But imagine, you could go back to fifth grade, you know, July 22nd or whatever, and see what happened on that day. Now, this is being seized by companies. Uh, in case you don't want to go full whole hog like Thad does um, in one of a more subtle fashion statement, you can now buy these uh, Momoto life logging wearable cameras with GPS, uh, small, discreet, and it takes a picture every few seconds uh, all the time. So you can constantly know where you were and what you did, and it keeps track of your life. You can go back. But memory is not just facts. Okay? Memory works at lots of levels. It's, it's the memory of, of, of facts and literature and images. It's also memory of movements. Right? There's procedural memory. Memory informs judgment. It, it tells you how to act and what to do and how to plan for the future. More than just a camera. More than just a hard drive. And William Uttermolen was a reasonably renowned artist. He lived in England. Uh, the opening slide of my talk showed his artwork. And he's, his artwork has been rediscovered in many ways because there have been exhibits showing his artwork. Because this artwork demonstrates the loss of memory as well. So Uttermolen here, a self-portrait in 1967. And here's another self-portrait in 1996 when he was first diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And he cooperated with the doctors. He wanted to know how this would influence his art and what he thought about. And the doctors and he maintained resources so he could do self-portraits. And you can see with these self-portraits that there was a rather rapid decline. So that series of uh, paintings by Uttermolen demonstrates not only do we have to have memory for remembering what happened in the past, we need a kind of process of memory to, to work every day and to plan for the future. Its loss is obviously devastating. So many people think, even now, and it seems like memory is such a fantastic thing and it's irreducible. We'll never figure it out. So how do we unlock the secrets of memory? And I would say it's a huge huge challenge for science in the 21st century. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. But before I start, I want to bring everyone up to the speed on kind of the terms and, that I'll use. So neurons and synapses. Neurons are what's in the brain primarily. They're special cells. And these special cells signal to one and each other, one another, by voltage. And that's what makes neurons so special. They're the only cell that forms these complex networks, and these networks, by virtue of their signaling, can process information. They communicate with each other at very specialized points of contact called synapses. So in our brains, we have about 100 billion neurons. Each neuron has about 1,000, 10,000 synapses. So as a computer, if you think of it that way, we have a computer with 100 trillion synapses. So that gives us a lot of processing power to take in all this and um, uh, deal with the environment. 
So how do neurons work? Well, they talk to each other, but they don't talk to each other by blaring. They talk to each other at these very small points of contact. So you can think of them as they whisper to each other. It's private conversations, like that. So you can talk to one synapse, one conversation, another synapse has another conversation. They're kind of independent of each other. And it works something like this. One neuron, the information flow goes from right to left here. One neuron is called the presynaptic neuron, and the other neuron is called the postsynaptic neuron. And the synapse is actually this three-part thing, the pre-part, the post-part, and the space in between. And what's in between are those little red balls, and those are chemicals, and they're called neurotransmitters. So when the voltage changes here, it releases neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter then binds to the postsynaptic half of the synapse, and it turns it back into an electrical signal. So we have this system where you have an electrical signal, then a chemical signal, and back to an electrical signal. And this space is very important because other things can get in there. In fact, essentially all drugs that affect the nervous system work by diffusing into this space and modifying how one neuron talks to the other. So antidepressants, anti-anxiety drugs, anti-seizure medicines, they all work at the level of the synapse. Now, I showed you that synapse. Here's a little bit more detail about it. Presynaptic terminal, so voltage signal comes in here. And in our brains, and in fact in almost all brains, from fruit fly to us, they use one chemical called glutamate as a neurotransmitter. So glutamate diffuses out, and it binds to special receptors called glutamate receptors. And it works kind of like this. So glutamate would be the green thing here, and it binds to this receptor, which opens up. And then ions flow in to the cell and changes the voltage. Okay? So you can see these channels are very special. They're like barrels. The barrels are usually closed, and they can open up when glutamate binds to it. So now you know all the parts. Synapses are the points of connections, and um, they work. To, import, to basically allow networks of neurons to talk to each other and somehow process information. That doesn't really tell you how the nervous system works or how memory is stored. And different scientists have taken different approaches. Ramon, Santiago Romoni Cajal was a Nobel Prize in anatomist over 100 years ago. And his strategy was to look inside the brain. What are the neurons, and where do they go, and how do they connect? And maybe by just looking at them, he could figure out what they do. And so in these just beautiful, breathtakingly beautiful sections, microscopic sections of the brain, he would look at the neurons and their connections. And these little dots here, you can see these are, what, these are the neuron cell bodies. And then they sell out, send out these long processes, these strings that talk to each other. And in fact, this is just a microscopic section. And the way he did it, this is only about 1% of the neurons are actually there. So it's this incredibly complex fishing ball, you know, a line like a, a, a ball of fishing line that's just all crammed in there. And it's hard to tell what's going on. You can't look at that and say, oh, I know what this does. And here's another sec uh, section from another brain. Nevertheless, he did learn some general principles. But you can see, if this is the complexity from a very small section, how do you put this together for 100 billion neurons? There was another school of thought led by uh, Ivan Pavlov, who also won a Nobel Prize, and B.F. Skinner. And they took more of a psychological approach to it. Their idea was the brain is just hopelessly complex. You're never going to figure it out by looking at it. Let's take a black box approach. <laughs> So the idea is you can just measure inputs and outputs, and the brain is just considered a black box. It does something to an input. You see something, and then you catch the ball. So you know that the brain did some kind of processing uh, to uh, respond to that stimuli. And so the most famous example named after Pavlov was called Pavlovian learning. And uh, we all know, probably experienced this. You show some. Uh, Thing delicious like a meaty 
frankfurter, to a dog, and uh, you don't have to teach it to drool. It'll start drooling. But if you give a neutral bell, uh, there's no drool response associated with that. But Pavlov showed that if you just repeatedly pair the bell with the meat, you'll cause drooling because the meat by itself can cause drooling. And after a while, you don't need the meat anymore. The bell by itself will cause the drooling. Okay, and you've all experienced, anyone with a cat knows that that cat learns the sound of an electric can opener from like 80 miles away and will come <laughs> running over, right? So we all experience Pavlovian learning and conditioning. And of course, in the course of this work, Pavlov's work in dogs, it soon became apparent to other psychologists that learning was not a uniquely human thing or a dog thing. I mean, you could train seals, you can train mice. And in fact, when they tried hard enough, you could train bees, you could train flies. So they could all learn. They could all do this kind of Pavlovian learning, suggesting that the capacity to learn is extremely ancient. So what's common to these different kind of nervous systems? I mean, you know, flies can learn and humans can learn. What's changing during learning? Well, what's common is not a big brain. We have 100 billion neurons, and a fly has 10,000 neurons, and they can both learn something. And it's probably not the specific kind of connections between the neurons, because many brains are wired completely differently. So what else is common? Well, it's the synapses I told you about. Right? Synapses are found in all nervous systems, and they're extremely ancient. So we call that in biology, they're evolutionarily conserved. They were found as a great way from one neuron to talk to another. And it's the one thing that's pretty constant you find in all nervous systems. And I'll tell you about later that the parts that are in synapses are pretty much interchangeable between humans and mice and flies. Okay? So it's an ancient strategy used again and again. So how do we put this together? Complicated nervous system, different neurons, synapses. How do you learn? And a Canadian psychologist named Donald Hebb came up with a really kind of breakthrough concept in 1949. And it's been known now as kind of Hebb's law or uh, neurons that fire together, wire together. What he thought is what happens in memory is connections change with experience. So shown here, you can imagine there's a neuron and there's an input. And just imagine that's a presynaptic input that's coming from somewhere in the brain. Oh, that's a bell. And that neuron causes drooling. That's the drool neuron. Let's just pretend. Okay? The bell by itself does not cause any drooling. But we know that food by itself can cause drooling. And so the idea is if you pair these things again and again and again, you strengthen this synapse, which by itself was not sufficient to cause the drool neuron to fire, and now it fires. And so with this concept, it became, wow, OK, connections change. It's not that there's special parts of the brain necessarily, or, or neurons somehow store information. The storage is in the connections. So how do we think about that? Again, I show you a presynaptic neuron releasing glutamate. And there's the postsynaptic neuron. There are the channels. And you can record the voltage change or the current that goes into the cell with techniques called electrophysiological techniques. And so what you see here is a certain number of receptors. And so this synapse has a certain strength. We'll call it that strength, medium strength. And if you train this synapse for a bit, you can put in more receptors. At least that's the modern way of thinking how you make a st synapse stronger. It's not the only way you could do that. You could make the channel somehow super active. Okay. But one thought anyway is you get more channels. And with more channels, you get bigger currents and bigger voltage changes. And you can also have the opposite. You can weaken the synapse, perhaps, in the process of forgetting. And when you do that, you take away receptors, and the current gets smaller, and the voltage gets smaller. So I'm leading you down this path to start thinking that Changing connections is what memory is all about. And so we really want to understand what's required for those connections. What changes when I say change connections? 
Even if I, you believe that it's the number of receptors, how do you change the number of receptors? I mean, there must be some kind of machinery for all that. So you can see here, here's a neuron, presynaptic neuron, talking to a postsynaptic neuron, which itself is presynaptic to another neuron. And I show you these very simple cartoons. And I would say up to a decade ago, most people thought that synapses had a handful of proteins in them that were specialized. And they look kind of like the cartoons. And with modern techniques, we now know that's not true. There may be up to 1,000 different proteins, 1,000 different parts at these synapses. And we don't know what they do or how they got there and what their contribution to learning and memory is. So we need a systematic way of trying to decipher all that, figure all that out. So Cajal showed it's incredibly complicated. How are we going to study changes in synaptic strength if we think synaptic strength is important for memory? How are we going to change, study these changes in a sea of 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses? It seems impossible. Well, what if we could make it a simpler system? What if we could look at a single neuron level or just a handful of neurons so we could really clearly see, oh, this is one neuron with its process, and here's another neuron, so there's the presynaptic half, and that's the postsynaptic half. And then we can ask questions like, well, in the green, maybe these are the ion channels, the glutamate receptors I told you about. And so what do you need to make them? And how do you send them down this highway? How do you traffic them? How do you target them to go here and not there? How do you put them into the membrane? These are all the things we need to know. I mean, if we're taking kind of an engineering approach, how do you put it all together? And so one way is to study a very simple system. And the logic, the compelling logic to, to, to study a very simple system is I told you that the key thing that's important for learning and memory is the synapse, and the synapse is conserved. We see the same kind of synapses in all organisms. And so the, what I'm going to tell you about now is the nematode, the soil nematode C. elegans, and I show here a almost adult C. elegans. It's about a millimeter long, and it's got a head here with about 302 neurons and a tail here. And the neurons send their processes down the length of the worm. It doesn't have a spinal cord, but think of it as like the spinal cord. So it's a wonderful tool for geneticists, and you'll see why soon. Uh, it's very easy to grow in the lab. You grow it on these Petri dishes on agar. It has a four-day life cycle, so you can go from egg to full-grown worm in just four days. It's self-fertilizing. That means it can have sex by itself and have progeny. It doesn't even have to remember where mates are because you can propagate it uh, without any external um, manipulations. 302 neurons and 6,000 synapses in the whole organism. That's the same synaptic complexity as one neuron in our brain one out of the 100 billion neurons in our brain. It's transparent, so you can look inside it and see those neurons in a living organism. And you can study those neurons using electrophysiology. So there's only 302 neurons, and so we know something about the circuits. These glutamate receptors control the direction of the movement. It helps steer the worm to find things in its environment. And I show here just one sensory neuron that makes connections to a bunch of different interneurons. These interneurons express glutamate receptors, just the way our interneurons express glutamate receptors. And if you record from one of these neurons, and I didn't tell you it was from a worm, the recordings would look basically like those from your own brain. And the interneurons then instruct, instruct other neurons to tell the muscles how to uh, contract and where to go. So here's and the worm in the lab on a plate, moving around, exploring. For only 302 neurons, it's pretty smooth. Right? And every once in a while, it'll back up. It's looking for food, and they didn't find any food there, so it's going to take off in another direction. So what's nice is that same glutamate receptors and the same synapses that are so essential for our brains to work are so essential for the worm's brain to work. It also has to find its way around and remember where it's been. And so now we can tie that behavior to synapses and to glutamate receptors. 
And so we can again ask the question, how do you get, how do you make glutamate receptors and how do you send them down to the synapse and how do you put them at the right place? How do we do that? What's genetics mean? Genetics is really a fancy word for reverse engineering. Genetics usually try and break the system. So I showed you a worm that can find its way around. And you try and study worms that don't find their way around and figure out why that is. And using that kind of approach by instructively breaking the system, you learn more about how the system works in the first place. Preferably, you want to break the system one part at a time. By one part, I mean one gene. And you all know that in each of your cells, you have, you have the genetic code, the genetic information that encodes proteins. And in us and in most organisms, we have between 20,000 and 30,000 genes that make proteins. An amazing thing that no one would have ever predicted is you have almost the same number of proteins in the worm as you do in us. They're just put together in different ways. OK, so 20 to 30,000 genes. And importantly, the synaptic proteins, those that are involved in synapse function, are conserved. People have done the experiment already. They've taken a protein from a fly and found its cousin in the mouse. And they replaced it with the fly one. And it works. Okay, And I'm telling you this to relieve you of the anxiety that you might have that if we study things in the worm, they're specific only to the worm. That's not true. Okay? They're conserved, so we learn in the worm, what we learn from the worm can be applied to the study of mammals, for example. For genetics, smaller is generally better. If I want to instructively break something, let's say one part at a time, and there's 20,000 parts, that means I want to break one thing in one animal at a time. I mean, which means I need 20,000 animals. That's going to be hard for mice. You can put four in a shoebox, maybe. They won't like each other in a while. For flies, you can put a lot more in bottles. But worms are actually perfect. In a shoebox, you can probably, probably put 15,000 worms. They live, they go from birth to adult in four days. So you can very quickly go through tens and tens of thousands of worms looking for things where the glutamate receptors don't work properly, hoping that this will shed light as to how learning takes place. And one trick that we've used in the lab that was uh, developed by uh, graduate students in the lab almost a decade ago now was to make the spotting of, of broken worms easier. They supercharged the worms. They put in a hyperactivated glutamate receptor. And you can tell immediately this worm doesn't look anything like the worm I showed you before, which was languidly exploring its environment. This worm just goes backwards and forward. Okay? The glutamate receptors are on more than normally, so it's just always going back and forth. We've created a neurotic, obsessive-compulsive worm. Okay? <laughs> it wants to leave, but then it thinks I left the gas on checks one more time. <laughs> and we can exploit this in the lab. What we do is we just put worms on one edge of a big plate and food on the other. And normal worms, why, by an hour, most of them are there. By two hours, almost all the worms are there. But these supercharged worms, and these supercharged worms are supercharged because we activated their glutamate receptors, they don't get there. It takes them a long time. They eventually get there. Remember, they're neurotic. They can smell the food. They yearn for the food. But then they worry that they, they forgot to do something. And so they shuffle back and forth, and they don't get there. So if you follow the logic, you can see what I'm going to do now. I'm going to use standard techniques, x-rays, mutagens, to break the DNA one part at a time. And I do it in tens and tens of thousands of individuals. And if I break that receptor or the things required for that receptor, will the worm go back and forth like that? No. It'll be freed from its anxiety, and it should get to the food faster. And so I can put thousands of worms on one edge, wait an hour, and see, is there a worm that makes it to the food? Because now, its hyperactivated glutamate receptors are not working properly. 
And so, in fact, we've done this again and again, and we found worms that don't look like the lurch anymore because they're broken. They don't look quite normal yet either. And so we thought, these are really interesting worms. They're worthy of further study. Let's figure out what part was broken. And these are the techniques of molecular biology and genetics. These are the techniques that we teach undergraduates here. These are the techniques that undergraduates, even high school students in my labs, have used to discover new genes. And what they've discovered is that de the decades-long idea that glutamate receptors are just those barrels, those channels, is incorrect. That they're part of a much larger signaling machine. So you see buried here, that's the original receptor. But surrounding it are these other kinds of proteins, all which came out of these genetic studies I told you about. SOL1 and SOL2 and STG1 and STG2. The names don't matter. The point is that they all influence the behavior of that channel. How can we show that? How can we study that? Again, we can use techniques that undergraduates learn now. There is a special protein discovered in jellyfish. It's called green fluorescent protein. If you shine blue light on it, it will fluoresce green. And any student can now learn how to take that DNA that makes that green fluorescent protein and make a transgenic animal, for example, a worm. So that worm now expresses green protein. Or you can use that DNA that encodes GFP to stick it onto the protein that you're interested in. Let's say that glutamate receptor. So now it's a receptor with a green light bulb on it. This is really quite amazing. And it can be done in a week or two for, the, for, for worms. And so you can see how useful it is. I can take a worm now. It's transparent and I can have it express this green fluorescent protein. So I can immediately look under the microscope and say, hey, there are the cells, and there's the process. And we can dissect open the worm, and we can say, hey, there's the neuron I'm interested in, the, one of the neurons required for the worm to go backwards. And using electrophysiology, I can then record from that neuron and say, well, what's wrong with that cell? Okay? Is the synapse working the right way or not? And using that kind of strategy, you can see immediately What's going on? I told you channels are these pores, right? And ions flow through when glutamate activates them. So here's the glutamate, and it activated them. And here's where you have kind of a normal complement of that signaling machine. It has a GLUR1, an STG1, and a SOL1. And you see, boom, when glutamate comes on, the current is very big. And then the current kind of decays. There's a fail-safe mechanism that even when the receptor is bound to glutamate and it's open, after a while, it has a fail-safe close. And that fail-safe close is called, gluta is called desensitization. And after a while, that desensitization gets relieved and you can open it again. So what are these other proteins doing like SOL1? Well, we can study that by leaving out SOL1, looking at a mutant. And what you see is the currents are dramatically different. The channel is still there. The channel does open but it almost immediately flops closed again. Okay? And this is an extremely important principle because what we've shown is that these synaptic proteins that control current, that control voltage, they're assembled in a kind of mix and match way. So you can change the properties of these synaptic channels uh, as a function of what their partners are. So these proteins, stargaze and, and SOL1, we call them auxiliary proteins. They modulate the function of the receptor. And this is a critical insight, because what else do we do? Every one of us has taken some drug that modulates the function of receptors. That's what drugs do. All drugs work by binding to receptors and changing their properties somehow. We have the same kind of process occurring inside our own brains, and they're called auxiliary proteins. So. The synaptic signaling for glutamate, we're still trying to get to learning and memory, but I showed you, and I'm showing you now, that the machinery is way more complicated and way more interesting than we originally thought. There are many classes of auxiliary proteins. And this is particularly exciting for the pharmaceutical industry. They have been trying forever to make drugs to affect things like schizophrenia and depression and Alzheimer's disease. And the way you design drugs is you look for targets. 
And up to a decade ago, the only target they had was the receptor itself. Now we have far more targets. Well, these could also, of course, have important roles in memory. Uh, and we don't know what they are yet, but we uh, think that when you assemble a complex like this to strengthen the synapse, it's not clear what the first step is, and we're trying to figure that out. But these auxiliary proteins uh, may actually have a central role in establishing the strength of synapses. And of course, uh, my colleagues and I are incredibly interested in understanding how the complex is assembled and targeted to synapses, synapses and regulated. Well, one thing that's obviously clear, you have this signaling complex. It's got to get to the right place. It's usually made in the cell body. And if you think of the cell body as this auditorium, the synapses are far away. They're over at the, at the football field, some of them. Okay? So you have to get a long way to the site of action. And it's still a mystery uh, how exactly the t receptors and the auxiliary proteins get there. Uh, some people think it's motors. Other people think it's diffusion, local translation. These are kind of buzzwords. But the point is, how do they get there? And one approach to understanding how they might get there is just to look. Look at them. And uh, you can't do that in our brains. We've got a skull. We've got billions of neurons. You're never going to be able to see individual channels and proteins going from one point to the other. But in the worm, you can. So again, using this protein, green fluorescent protein, by the way, a Nobel Prize was awarded for that discovery and its translational use in C. elegans. In fact, it's one of the three Nobel Prizes that's been awarded to people working in this soil nematode system in the last decade. Anyway, that was just a little salesmanship. <laughs> this protein, these receptors, these glutamate receptors that I've been telling you about, you can light them up by putting on this green fluorescent light bulb. Okay, So it's quite beautiful. This is a live worm, and we have a microscope, and we're looking down at it, and there's one cell body, and there's another cell body, and that's the process. And these little accumulations of green represent glutamate receptors at the postsynaptic membrane. Okay? You don't see all the inputs that come to it. You just see the, re the synapse itself. Everyone follow that? So let's blow this up even more. This is a synapse a synapse, a synapse. So these are far away now from the cell body. What's going on? We want to understand how the receptors got to populate these special points. And so we can use another trick. We can get rid of all that signal. We can use a laser and bleach it. Okay? So we turn on the laser so bright that all the signal goes away. And when we do that, we see darkness, which is perfect. Because with the contrast of darkness, we can now see what happens. Where do the new receptors come from? Do they kind of trickle in from the, from the sides? Do they come in by express train? So let's see. Well, the answer is they come in by express train. Now, this is in real time. That's two microns. So they're going about a micron a second. And they don't stop randomly. This guy stopped right here where there used to be a synapse. You can see there's this movement going in both directions all the time. Okay? It's like a superhighway of receptors whizzing by in both directions. And sometimes they stop, they think about it, they make a delivery, they do some removal operation. So there's this constant activity going on, which was a huge surprise. And we think it works kind of like this. And so there's an artist rendition. These are microtubules. They, you can think of them as like the train tracks. And they're running along the length of those neurons I told you about. And you can form train tracks. And you can disform them. And that's under control, uh, poorly understood control. And then along these train tracks run these special motors. That little guy there is the motor. And it's carrying a big vesicle, a cargo container. And these little things studying the surface in our case, these are the glutamate receptors. So they're moving along. The motor requires energy, and it's moving along down that highway, bringing the receptors to the synapse. So we think now, at least 
my group does, that synapses are stations on these intracellular railways. And our groups identified what those engines are. They're specialized motors called kinesin. And we know the railroad tracks, they're microtubules, and they run in both directions. We know the cargoes, at least some of the cargoes, like the glutamate receptors. We know where they go, synapses. But we don't know if they're involved, for example, in memory. We assume they're, they're necessary, because if you don't get the receptors there, obviously the synapses aren't going to work properly. But we want to understand more about how the trains get to the right destination. So it would be nice if we could study learning. And uh, I wouldn't be here if worms didn't also learn. So 302 neurons and 6,000 synapses, they can learn. And they can do a Pavlovian learning paradigm. And I told you the original Pavlovian paradigm was a bell and meat. Here we have meat is bacteria, which is their food. And instead of using a bell, we pair it with temperature. So the worms are exposed to food either at a cold temperature or a warm temperature. And then they're asked later to choose. If they're put on a gradient of cold to warm, where do they prefer to go? And if they were paired in their training with cold temperature, they go to the cold. And if they were paired in the warm, they go to the war uh, warm. And that can be reversed. So it's a very simple form of learning, yet it is learning. And so you can see this here. Here are little worms. They're only a millimeter long. And they were trained. Well, I'll let you guess at what temperature they were trained. And now we put them on the gradient from cold to warm, and let's see what happens. So this is sped up. This takes about half an hour. So which temperature were they trained at? Warm. They go to the warm side. So even worms can learn. And we'd like to understand what's changing in that nervous system as a function of learning. And in fact, we can look at particular neurons and the synapses. Again, these are the glutamate receptors, specialized points of contact, the synapses. And this is before training. And you can see in certain training paradigms, you can see that these synapses are about the same, but this synapse has gotten greatly strengthened. Okay? So experience is changing the strength of that synapse the same way Hebb invoked 60 years ago. Right? It's changing the strength of the connection. It's doing that by putting more glutamate receptors and probably other things. And we'd love to know how it does that. So here's the central puzzle, is if we think of synapses as stations along this train, these train tracks, there has to be some kind of signaling mechanism. So the glutamate receptors are delivered to the right synapse and not the wrong synapse. You want the right thing strengthened and maybe another one weakened. And that has to be under some kind of control. And there must be some kind of signaling system that we still have very little idea of how it might work. But we think that the signal might be at the synapse itself that when you use a synapse, it puts out a flag and it says, make me stronger. How might that work? In Utah and many Western states, trains didn't have time to stop at dusty old train stations. There was a train master, station master. He would put out a sign if you needed mail delivery or pickup. So that would be the sign. And the trains didn't stop. Trains had something special called a mail hook. Okay? So it was, it was kind of automated. So here comes the locomotive. It's certainly not going to stop here or Logan or anywhere else on its way. But the mail hook is, the sign is out. And so it's going to make a delivery and a pickup. Here, look, wait for it, wait for it. There, there's the mail. And the hook came out and took in the new receptors. So we think that an analogous system must be happening at synapses. It's a way of selectively strengthening or weakening synapses. Because the ones that are used put out the flag saying, I need more. What I've told you today is the importance of synapses. It's where the rubber meets the road. This is the action site. 
They're also the most vulnerable sites in our brains. Okay? Synapses are extremely vulnerable to stress, the trauma. And the synapses are the first thing to decay in performance in neurodegenerative disorders and in disorders such as Alzheimer's. So it's the earliest sign of disease is usually at the synapse. And you can see why. The synapse is where strengthening connections occurs. And those connections need to be maintained for memory. The other weak spot, it turns out, is along the highways. Many neurodegenerative disorders, including Alzheimer's, are marked by traffic jams. And you can now see why those traffic jams might be so destructive, right? You no longer can weaken or strengthen or deliver essential elements to the synapse. So what you've learned today is at least my lab's view of how learning and memory takes place and why we can really profitably take advantage of a very simple nervous system to get a, gain a mechanistic understanding of how neurons talk to each other and how those connections might be strengthened by experience. I've shown you that the glutamate receptors are critical for this, but they are complicated protein machines. They require auxiliary proteins. And this is a tremendously exciting development and concept because these auxiliary proteins give us new hope and new strategies for drug intervention. I also said that motors help drive memory. And it's an enormous puzzle of how these motors move and how they, go, and, and how they end up to going to selective uh, synapses. So the talk says uh, new insights. I gave you some new insights. I'm going to give you some new directions, or at least grand challenges. One of the grand challenges I've already told you about, how are synapses selectively strengthened? And that's the key thing. We really don't understand the selectivity that well. The other key thing, which is unbelievable, is how these synaptic changes are translated into oftentimes lifelong memory. Now, you might remember a phone number from two years ago. And that might be reflected in a change in synaptic connections. But every protein at those synapses from two years ago is gone. It's been replaced by new proteins. These receptors I told you about, it sounds great, right? This talks to that, and you have these receptors there, and you put more of them or fewer of them, but the receptors only live a day to a week. How does that take place? What I'm telling you is these synaptic connections are being strengthened, but the parts are continually being replaced. Think of if you have a computer, in a month from now, you find out that every chip's been replaced. They're all different, but you haven't lost any data. Okay? So there's some kind of templating going on where the, not only are things being replaced, but there's a, a, a system to replace them without changing the relative concentrations of anything. That is an enormous mystery. What are the, some of the techniques we can use to try and unlock these mysteries? Well, one of the things we want to do, though these learning protocols, it's very hard to do learning in a little brain, in a little worm. It's hard enough to do it with us. Okay? Maybe we can skip the learning part and teach neurons to learn kind of by remote control. And so there are these proteins called, for example, channel rhodopsin, found in archive ancient little critters. Okay? And these channels had the remarkable property that you can turn them on with light. Okay? Not with glutamate or some neurotransmitter, by shining light on them. And they'll open up. The other remarkable thing is you can take one of them and put them into your nervous system or a mouse's or a worm's or a fly's and they'll work. And so when students in my lab made transgenic worms, that means worms that express this protein in their nervous system. Every time I turn on blue light, the worm goes backwards. Okay, because it's turning on those glutamate receptors. I express these in the presynaptic neurons. I don't need food now to drive things or other stimuli. I can do it with light. 
And that gives me a tremendous power to try and understand how synapses work. And I can extend this light to do very hot, what we call high throughput type analysis. Instead of looking on plates the way I showed you, which is a very powerful way, there's a far more powerful way. This is a little chip constructed out of plastic. It's called microfluidics. These little channels here are just 100 microns in diameter. So they're like printed circuits, but they're tubes. And this in here in this t is a worm. And I'm going to try and teach this worm using light on the microscope slide. And I'm use the same approach I told you about before. Break them. Mutagenize the genome and look for things that don't learn the right way. But I can do this now by remote control. So I can use light, for example, to activate the neurons. And there's a worm. Its head's twitching. And boom, I studied it. It goes there. The next one goes there. This one I don't like. It's going here. Right? You can do this overnight. You can watch the Super Bowl and the experiments going on for you, right? <laughs> worm after worm after worm is being analyzed. So the kinds of things I've told you about today and that are going on in my lab and in many labs across the country really require a new synthesis. Right? I don't need just biology and the techniques of genetics and the perspective of evolution. I need techniques from chemistry, green fluorescent protein and physics, great microscopes, and math, how to model these things, and engineering to make microfluidic chambers. I need all these techniques. I need them to come together in a new kind of synthesis. And that's what goes on in my lab. And there are undergraduates who contribute to this and benefit from this. Story Jensen was a high school student when she first came to my lab. And she made tremendous contributions to the lab. Erica Johnson is an undergraduate. She's made contributions to the research I told you about. They've been able to benefit and help guide this new kind of educational thought. But we would like, what we would like to do is to extend this to all of University of Utah to make this new kind of knowledge and education and strategy available to any interested undergraduate who attends the University of Utah. Because face it, I'm not going to make the contributions that are going to lead to any significant cure for Alzheimer's or even figure out why the trains go in one direction or another. It's your sons and daughters, the next generation that will. And they need to learn this kind of new science. And so with the help and support of the president of the University of Utah, David Pershing, and the dean of the College of Science, Pierre Sikalski, as well as generous support from Gary Crocker, we're trying to put together a center for cell and genome science that will actually bring together faculty from these different departments. The departments stay the same. But some of them come together in one building and rub elbows together to try and work on these really tough problems. And our dream is to renovate the beautiful Utah Museum of Natural History that's on President's Circle. And we'll, we want to keep it just like that, make it modern inside, and bring together these different departments. In the back, and the back's really ugly, we'll change it, and we'll make it <laughs> into a nice new research. And so the idea here is to have education and research both kind of motivate each other in really a very dynamic and unique kind of opportunity for the students uh, of the state of Utah. So finally, I just want to end with acknowledgement to past and present lab members, to my collaborators at different universities, and funding from different agencies at the National Institutes of Health. And with that, I'd like to take your questions. If possible. Thank you. Yes.